Hearts Prayer series. I'm preaching today on uh, Lead Us Not Into Temptation, and uh, a difficult message uh, to preach and prepare for. Uh, every time I preach on temptation uh, that week, there are things that get in the way. Uh, I think when, when Satan begins to see the church work on some of the very tools in which Satan uses to uh, disarm us and derail us, uh, he pulls out. Uh, he pulls everything out. In fact, this morning there was some, some battle. My, uh, my sermon was not where I thought it was. And so I had to go find it electronically. So my wife had to go back home and, and, and find it on another a drive that I had because the internet wasn't quite working the way it normally does for me. And, you know, but those are some of the things that sometimes we have to fight when we're working through things in our walk with God. Uh, so lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. We'll be talking about that in two weeks because, of course, we'll have the concert next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, I am going to be with you because I don't want to miss the Temple Veil vale concert. We'll be back in town uh, Friday night, rolling in in the afternoon. If you would like to follow a Wombat, just go on to Facebook and type in W-O-M-B-A-T -W and you'll, you'll find our uh, Facebook page. It's open during this time. It's not open all year long, but during our trip, we leave it open so you can see pictures and folks download uh, their different posts and all that, so you'll have fun watching us uh, climb hills and, and sometimes maybe falling over here and there, but uh, after the ride, that is. Uh, so we'll have, I, I know we'll have a good time, but uh, I'll be back next Sunday uh, with you for the concert, and I, we're going to have a tremendous time. I, I think I told some of you, maybe I announced it a couple of weeks ago, that this group, Temple Vale, called me uh, just out of the blue and said, we are in the UK, we're coming through Canada during uh, August, and about August 20th, we need a place uh, to have a concert and to sleep. And so a couple of our families are hosting the four individuals in this uh, group. I know there's just a picture of two, but the group is, is four people, uh, one couple, husband and wife, and then two single men. And so uh, uh, when <coughs> they give their concert, uh, I was just like, I said, well, I need to interview you a little bit, and what are your, what's your pedigree and all that, and, and I was just really amazed, and uh, I talked to a few leaders, and we're kind of going out on the limb, we've not seen them, any of us in concert before, they've done some uh, pre-concerts for some well-known artists, I put in the, the bulletin you note there, but uh, I hope you don't miss that, I, I think we're going to be in for a real treat, and it's actually a violin and acoustic guitar. Now they may have keyboard as well. I wouldn't be surprised because there's four in the group. But they also use, a, they don't have a drum set with them because they like to travel light, but they carry with them a, a box. Have you ever heard of a box drum? Some of you have. It's a rather interesting in instrument. It's basically a, a, a four-sided box, of course, just like you would think, and they play it like a drum. And so we're just going to be in for, I think, a real treat uh, next next Sunday. Don't miss it. Well, turn in your scriptures to John chapter 4, please, as we continue this series. We've been uh, really been working on the Lord's Prayer. It's been emphasizing prayer in our own hearts, hasn't it? Been? And I hope that this is increasing your prayer life and certainly helping you to know how you can approach God and the things that God is interested in talking to you about. God is very interested in this issue of temptation in your life. He knows, ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, and when God had to literally say no to the first of creation, He had to put this couple outside the Garden of Eden. They could no longer be given entrance into paradise, the Garden of Eden. And ever since that day, you and I do not know what it's like to live in paradise. Now, I don't know, uh, for those of you that are married, you might have a spouse next to you, and you're thinking of your spouse right now, and you're just thinking, he's just paradise, right? Uh, you're thinking, she's just the cat's meow. Uh, I have an announcement to make, by the way. Some of our folks who have lost loved ones, certainly spouses, our hearts certainly uh, go out to you, and, and that's just a different kind of life when you lose a spouse. Uh, you know that Bill Moore uh, lost Gloria about, how long has it been, four or five months? Maybe a little longer, but um, uh, Bill got married yesterday. Amen. Bill Moore got married yesterday. He and his wife 
and another couple were best friends for 50 some years, and he ended up marrying his best friend's wife. And their, their spouses were deceased, of course, and they were married, and she lives in Davison, so he's not going to be attending here. They'll come back to visit, but hopefully soon he'll bring his bride back and we can introduce them. Um, but uh, anyway, I can't remember why I'm telling you that, but I was looking over here. So, Bill Morris is married. But you know, when God starts ministering to us, and when things sometimes just gain momentum in your spiritual walk, temptation can move in. And so we pray in this prayer, lead us not into temptation. In other words, Lord, help us to overcome temptation in life. This part of the prayer gets very personal, doesn't it? It's now more about us. It's getting kind of focusing inward. The last couple of phrases are, right, give us this day our daily bread. And, uh, and give us, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We've gone through those three phrases. And now this fourth personal phrase, lead us not into temptation. John chapter 14 helps us with this phrase. John chapter 14 and verse 15 reads as such. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Here's, here's the beautiful affirmation. Can you hear Jesus speaking to you? But you know him. Isn't that a wonderful thing to hear? Just hear it again. But you know him. You know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. This is my place, sorry. Be with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and will show myself to him. Aren't these wonderful words? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It, it stands on its own. But you call us to, to speak on it and, and to reflect on it. So give me words, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to be tempted? Let's begin to gather the, uh, just the essence of our subject today. And where does temptation come from? We know that temptation ultimately comes from the evil one. But temptation sometimes comes from others, doesn't it? Others who have been deceived. Temptation can come from you. You can be tempting yourself if you begin to entertain uh, uh, Satan's presence. And there's times when, when Satan has tempted you that you have fallen into temptation so much that Satan will even leave you. Hey, Satan is not always with you. Satan is not like the Holy Spirit. Satan doesn't uh, take residence wherever he wants. Uh, he is very located. And so... Uh, Satan and his demons are the whisperers uh, that we don't want to listen to. But they are not everywhere like the Holy Spirit is. And so Satan will often leave us when he knows that we're undone. If we're undone and we begin to live a, a deceitful life, an evil life, a yielded to temptation life, he doesn't have to be around after a while. And that's when we tempt ourselves, when we fall into the trappings of life. If we look at the scriptures and accept it, though, as the word of God, then is when we begin to understand right and wrong, and it becomes our litmus test for the life we live. <coughs> There's a pastor of a Presbyterian church in Kansas, in Kansas who relates this little story. After a four-year-old boy told his father he had a stomach ache, the father suggested uh, that's because it's empty, son. He said, you'll feel better if you eat something. So he gave the child a glass of juice. A couple of days later, the family, family's pastor came by that same house, and uh, the pastor mentioned 
in his conversation that he had a bad headache. The little boy responded with this. He said, that's because it's empty. <laughs> You'll feel better if you put something in it. <laughs> well, the question for us this morning is, what are we putting in our head? And in our heart, of course. What are we putting in that can multiply, that we can feed upon him in our hearts, as the scripture tells us? In John 14, verses 15 and following, it says, If you love me, keep my commands. It's an interesting connection. At, at the very start, love and commands are together, and they're together on purpose. Does this mean that love is conditional? Let's visit that for a moment. And are we to live a legalistic life to get love out of God? That's not it at all. In fact, love has always been and always will be our motivating factor for our lives in Christ. If you have Christ in your life, you have the love of Christ. He loves you, and he's enjoying your love for him. That is your relationship with Christ. Nothing takes that away. But God also says in his word, if you love me, you'll, you'll obey my commands. And so why do we obey the commands? Because God knows how to live life. God knows how to know how to go on a bike trip and be safe. God knows how to live your life, your life in, in marriage, your life as a single person, your life maybe single again. God knows how to order your life if you'll follow his word and listen to him and trust him that everything he says in his word is for your very good. The very nature of temptation then is linked to a way of living that is just as that is not just as fulfilling as some membership in a club where we have to pay dues or do certain things. But a lifestyle where God's love teaches us how to live the most fulfilled life ever lived. To live our lives in Christ is to live a fulfilled life that the world can see and say, if you don't give me that, I think I'll die. And I hope at the fire hall last night, the people at the fire hall went through the little festival that we put on for them including the dunk tank where the chief and I both had to kind of participate in. I hope that they saw the love of Christ in us. But what is it about love that we get wrong way too often? True love in each part of our life is about learning to love every day. And God allows us to work through this this thing called love. Learning how to love. How many times do we have to say as believers, I am sorry, would you let me try again? <laughs> but that's part of a love relationship with God and each other. Well, we'll come back to this in just a minute, but let's look now at why temptation is even on the map. You see, God gives us a way to live. The one who made us knows that if we pay attention to how he designed us to live, we will be fulfilled. I already mentioned that. We go back to Exodus 20, and we revisit the Ten Commandments. And I, I believe I have them up on the screen for you. Would you read them with me, just one through ten? Uh, have no other gods before me. No idols of any kind. Do not use the Lord's name. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your mother and your father. Do not commit murder. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not give false witness against your neighbor. And do not cover Jesus. Are these important? Do they help order our lives? They do, don't they? Uh, do we keep these ten to get into heaven? Not, no, no, that's not the right way to say it. Just because we say something doesn't mean it's true. We don't, we don't live these commands to get into heaven. We live these commands because God knows how to order our life. He knows that uh, we'll do really well 
by not taking each other's lives. You know? I don't want you to have to come visit me, right? And others we have to go visit because they've broken laws of various kinds. And so we have a we even have the law of the land that bases their laws after most all of these. At the beginning of our country, our, our laws were ordered by all of these. And now it's most of them, if you know what I mean. So we read in the Gospel of John just now, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If we're not careful, though, uh, we leave out the love quotient. We can start to live this, and then the love quotient just kind of falls away because we're so busy, uh, the pastor told us not to do this or that. Let me tell you, uh, I'm going to visit one subject that I really shouldn't visit, and it's absolutely not in my notes. But here we go. I, I grew up in a generation that preached on some things that you shouldn't do as a Christian. And they weren't necessarily Ten Commandments. And, and there's one area that you just don't hear me preaching about. I don't, can't remember the last time I mentioned uh, like the subject of alcohol uh, and its use in our society. Uh, if you look in our discipline, in our membership covenant, it says it asks free Methodist Christians to stay away from alcohol. And it's made some changes uh, from uh, years past. Uh, we, we toyed with the idea that, that drinking was a sin, and, and in fact, that is not uh, a very good statement to make. But our church has also taken a stand to say, we're asking you to stay away from certain things that we think are less than healthy. When we begin to see something destroy our culture, for instance. When we see that, when you look back in history, did you know that there's never been uh, a fall of any kingdom in history that wasn't directly tied to the abuse of alcohol. Mm. I don't want to be one of those. I'm afraid we're headed down the wrong direction as a country. But what do we say about those subjects? What do we say about the do's and don'ts? I, I don't ever want you to hear your pastor say, thou shalt not and give you my list of 27 things you shouldn't do. Because I believe God gives us His Word and it teaches us. And it teaches us about how to handle these things in the context in which we live. And, and so I can, uh, I'm not going to do that with you, but I'm going to press you on your personal relationship with Christ. That are you in the Word? And are you in a discipleship place outside of this worship that helps you know day to day how to order your lives? How to take these Ten Commandments and pay attention to them. Because they will bless you. And they will also show us when we sin. If we preach the word in Romans that says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, then we're all in this together and we need salvation and forgiveness of sins. And if Romans 6.23 says, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, then we understand that our sin separates us from God and there's, the wages is death. Then it's only through salvation in Christ. How can we know what sin is if we don't have what God told us to pay attention to in front of us? We can go to the New Testament. Go with there with me now. In the, in the Gospel of Luke, we find the two great commandments. And you might argue with me, Pastor, we, we don't really focus on this anymore. We focus on love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Very interesting two phrases, wonderful phrases. By the way, if you live out these two verses, do you know what you're living out? The ten. But you also live out spreading the kindness. Just a little advertisement there. We're continuing to spread the kindness. When we do things for others, remember our, our spreading the kindness tree? And the cards that we get to leave? I would love to tell you my story, but I won't. Because you have a story too. And let's continue to spread kindness. When we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors ourselves, then we begin to say, I don't care if their music is too loud. Some of you know what neighborhood I live in. Maybe it's, maybe it's similar to you. I'm, I'm noticing some of our church families are moving. We've had two church families move into our neighborhood since we moved there. That's awesome. Let's take over the center of Port Huron again and just create a revival there. But wherever you're living, how do you love your neighbor? Especially when they don't like you, maybe. 
Or maybe you don't like them. Take them an apple pie anyway. That little card that says bread on the table. And so we, we have these commands. Pastor, isn't it enough? But what about that next phrase? Right after Luke 10, 27, there's a very important phrase that goes with it. Against such things there is no law. In other words, if we live these two commands that Jesus gave us, the two great commandments, they're called, then all the others will take care of themselves. Because if you're living this, you will live the other ten. You folks were right. You said it. We need to live that out. It's called a personal relationship with God in His Word. The, man, the, the problem of the man who approached Jesus in this passage about the commands of God misunderstood what we get wrong so often. That if we do this, and this, and this, like a list, we will fulfill something that gets someone off our back. And that's not the point at all. It's not the point of the gospel. It's not God's plan for our lives. It's not about us getting Papa Bear off our back. It's about being in love with Him. And letting Him love us. And growing in our relationship with Him. Whether you call it legalism or a pecking order or some fulfillment of a club, God has nothing to do with that. But he does invite us into a personal relationship of love with him. The motive of love has been and always will be his plan for our life. But what about temptation, Pastor? This message is about temptation. And it is, so let's get back to that, to that point. <laughs> Temptation appears most in living in a pecking order, a list-fulfilling, command-focused life. If we're in temptation's way, then maybe we're falling into this, I'm just going to do these things to be good. We don't need to be good. God makes us good. And it's in our relationship that we become holy. I'm not saying that the presence of temptation means you are far from God necessarily. That wasn't true for Jesus in the temptation in the desert. But a constant temptation should challenge us to consider what or whom is really in our heart. Let me give you this morning now quickly four helps in living a life above temptation. John 14 reveals it. Four helps in living a life above temptation. You were worried I wasn't going to fill in the blanks for you. <laughs> First of all, love God. Love God. <clears throat> don't, don't move past that too fast, please, Christian. To love God is to know you can sit in His presence to say the quietness of your morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're with Him in conscious pursuit of Him, <clears throat> I love you, God. I love you. I want you today. I know you were with me yesterday and the days past, but I just want to remind myself and say it to you. I love you. Love God. Verse 15 says, if you love me. So there's a condition there. It's amazing when a new Christian finally gives up. Isn't it a joy when we get to see those around us, loved ones, or uh, just people that we get to know, and they say, I want God's way. I want God's love. I want, I want the Lord. I get it now. I get it now. Love God. But secondly, love God's commands because, because you love God. Second part of verse 15b. Keep my commands, God. Keep my commands, it says. And there are many in our world, there are many in your workplace or in your neighborhood, or even maybe in your family that say they don't want God because they're just afraid God will, what? Ruin their life. I'm just afraid God's going to mess with me because I have stuff I want to do. As I came up Griswold uh, from my house, I was uh, uh, in my truck. No, I'm sorry. I was in the church van because we're using the van today. I had it all loaded up. So I'm thinking vacation, by the way. You just need to know that, right? Yeah, yeah. 
And, and I'm coming up Griswold, and this guy in the pickup next to me um, had his dirt bike all tied down well. It was well cared for. This dirt bike only touches things in the dirt. It doesn't touch anything else. It was, it was ready. And he was headed somewhere. The single guy in the truck was headed somewhere with his dirt bike. And, and we can go do our dirt bike on Sunday. We can. We can go do what we want to do and leave God behind. And I'm not that person's judge. I'm just perceiving something. But there are many who walk away and they don't have interest in God. They think God's going to ruin their life. This was true of Kirk Cameron. Some of you know through Growing Pains, the show, his wonderful testimony. You've seen him in many Christian movies now because he changed some things in his life. In fact, when he was that young superstar uh, in Hollywood, a little boy uh, on Growing Pains became quite the popular thing. And a bit of an idol for many, many years. And one day he said, as he gave his testimony, he said, I had it all. I had the millions, even as a young teenager, at 14, 15, and 16, he had more money than probably all of us in this room. And he said, I, I just, I didn't have a care in life. I actually rode around in limos that were bulletproof because people wanted to get near me. I wasn't in threat of life, but that was my life. I enjoyed the high life. I rode the Learjets, even as a, a young person. He says, but when I, when I turned, I think he said 15 or 16, he wasn't even old enough to drive, and he was in pursuit of a woman. He said, this girl was beautiful. She was so beautiful, I was willing to follow her anywhere, and she walked into a church. Now, I don't know the circumstance. He moved quickly through this part of his testimony, but Kirk said, when I went to seek out this girl, even in this church, I found something that I didn't expect. For the first time in my life, I sat there, and I never, ever heard the gospel message. He said, I ended up marrying that woman, <laughs> and I ended up getting my heart right with God. And when I went back to the movie set, as a young man now, I had the decision to make, and there were certain things they wanted me to do and say in this sitcom, and he began to relate how when you start to change scenes in your, uh, in your script, uh, people have to go rewrite things, because you have an authority, in, in his case, and others have to relearn lines, and he says, after a while, I just began to be less than tasteful in the room. And the requests for my time were less and less. And my life changed, and I had to leave that place. The offers have been few and far between. But he says that's okay, because God is good. And many of you know his testimony as he's pursued other, other movies. Even in the movie Fireproof, where he was the lead role. At the end of the movie, you know where uh, they reconcile? in the fire hall of all places. He's a fireman and they, they, they reconcile there in that place. Did you know that they use, it's a silhouette scene, right? You only see their shadow. You don't actually see them because of the sun. And do you know who he's kissing? He's kissing his wife. She's not playing the role of his wife in the movie, but in that scene, he, he kisses his wife because he won't kiss another woman, even on screen. That's a change of lifestyle. That's a person who says, I love God's command, his commands, because I love God. And God ordered Kirk's life in a different way, and his life changed. But we also trust the spirit of truth, number three. The third way that we rise above temptation is that we trust the spirit of truth. In verses 16 and 17, Jesus says, He, the Father, will give you the Spirit of Truth. And who is the Spirit of Truth? Help me. Who is the Spirit of Truth? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. Yeah. Christ ascended to the Father after His resurrection. Not to leave us behind, but to give us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who gives testimony to Christ in our everyday walk. 
And so we receive the voice of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So will we trust the spirit of truth? That's what Jesus tells us here in this passage. And his word is his voice. Do you still hear the still small voice in giving you direction in your life? It begins with the word of God, doesn't it? When we read it and, and it helps us to pursue this personal relationship with Christ. And then the spirit of Christ speaks directly to you. Uh, a, a number of us were together over yesterday and, and as the afternoon went on, you know how pastors are, we're... I don't like the term working the room, but we're just meeting people. And, and I had no assignment. Uh, many of you were sitting by sandboxes and manning uh, this uh, so-called dunk tank. What did we call it? Mini dunk tank? Is that what we called it? And uh, we had a mini fireball. And some of you were helping kids shoot these little cups with little squirt guns and across this, this wire. And it was just it was a great time. And, uh, and, and I got beat in Cornhole by a couple of the firemen who uh, I've now befriended. Or, uh, no, not befriended. I've defriended them on Facebook because they beat me. But in all of that, in all of that, those of you that were with me and I with you, we were listening to the Holy Spirit. When we were playing games, when we were painting rocks, when we were helping kids put little uh, plastic tattoos on their arms, and uh, sorry, Carly, I wouldn't put one on mine. She begs me to put one on, and I wouldn't. Well, I just can't do that. I don't know why. It comes from my childhood, I guess. I, I, my mom was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but we were having a great time, and the Holy Spirit was telling each of us to do certain things. And the conversations we had, the prayer that some had with people, two families that said, hey, we need to try your church sometime. If you're here, we're glad you're here. And, and just those Holy Spirit moments that don't have direct uh, link to the Bible, but it's a reflection of God's word as God speaks to us and tells us and leads us to conversation others. Trust the spirit of truth. When we uh, we trust the spirit of truth in, in so many, many ways. Now we're taking, we're, we're still talking about how to rise above temptation, so let's just visit one more. This is the last thing that I see here. Please don't take this statement out of context, but this, here it goes. Everyone is in everyone. If you're not careful, that sounds new age. <laughs> I don't mean it quite like that. And I looked at this again last night, going, well, I might have said that a little different. Everyone is in everyone. Look at verse 20, and it says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And it's like Jesus is in God, he's saying, in the Father. You are in Christ, and Jesus is in you. In other words, everybody is in everyone. And I'm just trying to describe this fellowship of God the Father with us. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those of you uh, uh, viewing the shack, you're, you're seeing this movie, the second part today, and the third part next Sunday, correct? Um, you're, you're just seeing this beautiful picture of fellowship uh, with God. And I won't spoil that anymore, but, uh, but an amazing movie. You haven't seen it, you should. Sure? <coughs> Jesus is in God. You are in Christ, and Jesus is in you. And uh, boy, were we feeling the fellowship yesterday when we got towards uh, the end of the festival and here we were doing this uh, mini dunk tank and somehow the chief was kind of avoiding the dunk tank and we had kind of briefed each other ahead of time. You know that the chaplain and the fire chief have to go under the mini dunk tank, right? And he goes, yeah, I know. And so towards the end, we got all the firemen together and, and uh, the few that were there was kind of slowing down a little bit, and the weather was actually starting to move in. And, and uh, we had had some beautiful weather up till about 2, 2.30. And so there we were, and, and Chief Ed Grass and myself, and he and I had to decide who was going to go first. And so we flipped for it. In fact, one of the firemen uh, were ready. They stepped forward with one of these firemen medallions. And so we had an official coin cost uh, of, of who was going to go first under the mini dump tank. 
and cheap lots because I had prayed before the split. And <laughs> that's not true, you know that. And so Chief uh, was, was sitting there under the, this, this tripod with this bucket. It's kind of like the ice bucket challenge. It's about what it is. It's not a true dunk tank. And so somebody hits a paddle, and there's a valve that just opens up, and then there's this colander. Him to, Scott, this is so cool. You made this, I know. This colander. I say it right, colander. Under there, it just sprays the water out. It's just fantastic. And so, and so the person, they missed and missed and missed. And Chief and I had to go every other shot. So someone would miss, and he'd get out of the seat and not sit down. And, and so he wasn't wet yet. And so uh, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in the seat, and we had this, this dog there. He's called Sparky. And somebody egged him on. And he, of course, was in costume, you know, the fire dog. And nobody knows who's in the costume. I'm going to find out. But as I'm sitting there in the seat, uh, the Sparky is egged on by a certain person, and he hits the paddle, and of course I'm drenched, and the bucket was full. The bucket was full. And so I, I get out of there, and I have a few words for Sparky, and, and, and then Chief comes in, it's his turn, right? Well, when Chief sits down, all of a sudden, I didn't know what was going on, but the bucket was filling up, of course, and all the people were doing the right things. And one of the fire, uh, the, it's hard to say fire woman, one of the firefighters, one of the gals, uh, just new to the fire department, really a great person. And she's getting ready to throw it. And, and she's kind of in her windup. What she's doing is faking everything because there's two firemen up on the roof that have two giant buckets of water. And just as uh, they said, now don't throw it yet. One, two, three, and she goes like this, and both buckets come from off the roof. And Chief gets doused, like not even close to what, to what I did. He was just really wet. And the whole place just went crazy. Let me tell you what was going on. Everyone was in every one. I'm just illustrating for you how God helps us to see how when God is in us and we are in God, when we are in fellowship with each other, whether it's at a, a fire hall having a riot of a time, and the storms are rolling in, and we have to tear everything down quick before it pours, whether that's the fellowship that God gives us with each other, or sometimes just with Him, we can know that the fellowship is sweet, and God's presence is real like never before. Dear friends, when we live in fellowship, with God and man, the church, we will rise above temptation. When we are with each other doing the good of God, when we're obeying His commands, and we're saying, I am so excited not to go to jail today. <laughs> of course. I'm so glad that I'm living a life that in fact, when I see others, they seem to be blessed by my life. That's the kind of life we want to live, isn't it? And that's the life God has in mind for every one of us. The things in life that challenge us most, though, can be our own doing. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation. I showed this video a few weeks ago. I'm going to show it again. It's just a music video. Redeemed. Uh, by Big Daddy Lee. And as you listen to the lyrics of this song in the baby crying, you will you will hear it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You will hear these words from the Lord about how he has in mind to forgive you, to redeem you, to make you holy. Would you let him do that today? Because that's how we overcome temptation. Let's watch the song. Thank you. 